Peace be with you. Friends, now on this fifth Sunday of Lent, things are intensifying as these marvelous, uh, spiritually packed readings come to a kind of climax. We're preparing for Holy Week, and so we're dealing with some of the most sacred texts in the great tradition. Reading one, I want to spend some time with this, is from the book of the prophet Jeremiah. And the passage here is one of the most pivotal in the Old Testament. Easy to remember, by the way. It's Jeremiah 31, 31, and then following. But remember that. Get your Bibles out. Jeremiah 31, 31. Here's the text. The days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. <clears throat> covenant language. It was St. Irenaeus long ago who said the best way to read the Old Testament is in terms of the covenants that God makes with his people. Go back to a kind of covenant with Adam, a covenant with Noah, covenant with Abraham, a covenant with Moses, a covenant with David. What are these covenants? Not contracts so much, where they're like an exchange of goods, but more like a pledge of life. The, the basic form of covenant in the Old Testament is this. I will be your God and you will be my people. A covenant means a sort of sharing of life. It's a pledge of life one to the other. God saying, I will be loyal and faithful to you. Israel saying, Lord, we will be loyal and faithful to you. It's the heart of Israelite religion in many ways is, is the fact and the struggle of the covenant. Because what do we know now from even the most cursory reading of the Old Testament? Very often these covenants were violated. Hence, I will make a new covenant. See, what Jeremiah is, is envisioning here is the day when in a definitive way, God will establish this relationship permanently with his people, Israel. Now, here's something very important to get when talking about covenants. They are almost invariably ratified in the Old Testament by blood. So think of Noah, you know, when God makes the covenant and the, the rainbow in the sky is the sign of it, but it's sealed by a blood sacrifice that Noah makes. Think of Abraham when he makes his great covenant with the Lord. The Lord tells him to, to slice these various animals in two. Remember that dramatic scene from the book of Genesis? And, and uh, Abraham passes through the, the severed sections and then the, the, the light of the torch symbolizing God's presence. They say the idea was, the person was saying, may this happen to me, what's happened to these animals. May this happen to me if I violate this covenant. But they were sealed in blood. Think of Moses, you know, when the Ten Commandments come and the Sinai covenant, how is it sealed? Well, this great sacrifice of animals and part of it is splashed on the altar. The other part is splashed upon the people. What's the idea? It's the exchange of blood. Blood meaning life. Israel, as it were, shedding its blood on God, God shedding his blood on Israel. Think of the, the old, you know, becoming blood brothers. If you, you cut the wrists and then you, you blended the, the blood of two people. That's the idea. See, so much more than a contract, which is sort of a legal a contrivance, a legal arrangement. A covenant is a blood bond between God and his holy people. And then think, you know, the great covenant with David, which is sealed by the thousands upon thousands of sacrifices in the Jerusalem temple. What was that but the pouring out of blood? Same idea. The one making the sacrifice saying, may this happen to me, the death of this animal, may, may this happen to me if I break this bond. And the blood poured out symbolizes my lifeblood, Lord, poured out for you. The blood then being sprinkled upon the people. Go back now to the, um, the Day of Atonement, the holiest day of the Israelite liturgical calendar. And the high priest, that day alone, going into the Holy of Holies. 
and he would he would place the sins of Israel on the scapegoat and send them out into the desert. But the other animal he would slaughter, sprinkle the blood around the Holy of Holies, and then carrying the rest in a bowl, he'd come out and sprinkle it upon the people. Same idea. The people saying, Lord, we pledge our life to you. That's the sprinkling around the Holy of Holies. But then as the priest came out bearing the blood and then sprinkling upon the people, that's Yahweh, the God of Israel, pouring out his life upon his chosen people. All right. That's the wonderful, rich, strange to us, but, but marvelous Old Testament theology of covenant blood sacrifice. Now, as I say, one of the sad marks of the Old Testament story is that the covenant, though ratified again and again, God making this agreement again and again with his people, it's typically honored in the breach. It's typically violated. So, Prophet Jeremiah, who knew about all the covenants I've just mentioned, knew about that whole history of Israel. He's standing on the, on the terrible brink of destruction because the, the Babylonians are about to come to destroy the temple of Jerusalem. But Jeremiah knows the long history of covenant and of blood sacrifice and of the attempt by God see, to bring his life and his people's lives together. And he says... Again, Jeremiah 31, 31. The days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. So all the old ones, he knew about those. Something new is coming. Now, what will be the mark of it? Listen as he goes on. It will not be like the covenant I made with their fathers. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel in those days. I will place my law within them and write it upon their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Okay, so the law, God's commands, you know, I'll be your God, you'll be my people, and here's the way I want you to live. The law, in a way, was external to the people. It was out there and they were called upon to abide by it. What's he saying here? The prophet Jeremiah, the days are coming when I'm going to make a covenant where the law is not just outside of you, but the law is inside of you. That this sharing of blood will become so intense that God and his people will be melded together. God's law in their hearts. Okay. The church wants us to meditate upon Jeremiah 31, 31, because now fast forward about six centuries from the time of Jeremiah. And we come to a Passover supper hosted by this young rabbi and his 12 disciples. Passover supper. Over the Passover bread, he says this is my body given for you. And then, over that second cup, he says this, this is the chalice of my blood, the blood, listen now, of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Nobody hearing him at that table that night would have missed the reference. These were intensely biblical people. They wouldn't have missed the reference to Jeremiah 31, 31. What's he talking about? The new covenant that Jeremiah predicts. This ultimate sharing of blood between God and his holy people. So Jesus, this is the chalice of my blood of the new and eternal covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And he's offering this blood for them to drink. Moses indeed splashed the blood on the people. The high priest at Yom Kippur indeed came out and splashed the blood symbolically on the people. 
what's happening here. God himself is offering his life blood for his people to drink, <laughs> to take into themselves, to become their life. What Jesus of Nazareth is saying here is Jeremiah 31, 31 has been fulfilled. And watch. Where does the law of God go now as the church drinks in the blood of Christ? It's not out there anymore written on stone tablets. It's not just there as a, as a moral challenge. Jesus is himself the law of God, right? Jesus himself is the Torah made flesh. Therefore, when we drink his blood, God is writing his law upon our hearts. Everything anticipated, in other words, in the Old Testament history of covenant, Everything that Jeremiah foresaw is fulfilled at the Last Supper, is fulfilled with the pouring out of the blood of Christ. You know, I've said before, the whole purpose of covenant, law, temple, prophecy, everything, was to bring divinity and humanity together, right? That was the whole purpose of it. Who is Jesus? He is in his person the coming together of divinity and humanity. He's the covenant in person. Therefore, watch, when we eat his body and drink his blood, the covenant comes inside of us. The law written on our hearts. The last step, we go from Jeremiah <clears throat> to the Last Supper, now to every time you attend the Mass. Oh, the Mass, it's a nice time to get together, <laughs> celebrate our community, nice time to hear the Word of God, to sing together, and yeah, great. I agree with all those things. That's not the heart of it, though. What's the heart of the Mass? Behold the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. And then one by one, people come forward to eat and drink the body and blood of Jesus. The days are coming, says the Lord, well, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. It will not be like the old covenant written on stone. Rather, I will write my law in their hearts. It comes true, everybody, every single time you come forward and you eat and drink the body and blood of Jesus. The Lord is writing his law, his covenant upon your hearts. That's why, do you want to be happy? Do you want to find the point and purpose of life? Come to Jesus and stay with him. Eat his body and drink his blood. Bring his law literally inside your body. In that, God's great revelation comes to its fulfillment. And God bless you. Welcome back to the Word on Fire show. I'm Matthew Petrusik, Senior Director of the Word on Fire Institute and the new host of the Word on Fire show. Thank you for joining us. Euthanasia and the culture of death. St. Pope John Paul II used the term culture of death in his 1995 encyclical Evangelium Vitae to capture the secular world's dark confluence of poisonous ideas and practices that lead directly and indirectly to spiritual and physical ruin. Sadly, the encyclical's warnings have only become more prophetic and more prescient over time. We've seen that the culture of death has advanced on many fronts, but today we'll be focusing on the increasing legalization of suicide in the United States and abroad. 
Today, 10 U.S. states and Washington, D.C. permit assisted suicide. Many more states, including our home state of Minnesota, are likely to legalize it in the near future. Here to discuss the issue and how Catholics can and should respond is Bishop Robert Barron. Well, Bishop, welcome back to the studio. Uh, today we're talking about euthanasia and the culture of death, a rather dark topic. But yeah. be before we get into it, um, what have you been up to recently? Uh, I heard that you recently did the um, uh, the right of uh, of election. The right of election, which is a, a great thing I've done now for the past eight years as a bishop. It's when, you know, uh, candidates and catechumens preparing for either baptism or full initiation of the church gather usually on the first Sunday of Lent. And uh, it's a lovely ceremony, really. And they come up and they sign their names in the book. Then I sign the name. And it's kind of enrolling them now into this uh, final stage of the process. And so I went to one of our beautiful churches down in Austin, Minnesota, and folks came from all across the diocese. So I always enjoy that. And then that night, I left from that to go way up to the Twin Cities to a retreat center, actually just a little bit east on the Mississippi, and had a retreat with my priests. Um, so every couple of years up here, they do that. So I spent three really nice days with the priests of Winona, Rochester. And, um, you know, we, we listened to talks and we attended the liturgy and just had a lot of, you know, good fellowship together. So it was good. Let's always remember that there are beautiful things happening all the time like yeah. that as we transition into talking about it. Right. Topic. <laughs> things are not all dark, right? Yeah. So, so you recently wrote an article uh, in Evangelization Culture Online uh, entitled, It's Not Your Life, It's Not Your Death and it's not your choice. Mm -hmm. And you wrote in response to a, a new law that if passed, it hasn't been passed yet, but if mm -hmm. passed, would legalize assisted suicide right here in our home state of Minnesota. Yeah. Now, as, as the filming of it, it hasn't passed yet, but it's likely to, unless there's some significant resistance. Now, one of the, uh, the challenges that we face, and your article touches on this, is at the, the terminological level, the words that are used in the nature of the debate. So, as you know, um, the Minnesota bill is called the End of Life Option Act, but other examples include death with dignity, voluntary assisted dying, physician assisted suicide, and even borrowed from the abortion movement, my body, my choice. So yeah. the first question to address here is what role has euphemism really played in, in, in this debate? A lot. And all those suggest the primacy of, you know, freedom and choice in our culture has become almost like a fetish. Um, I took my article from a billboard that I saw in California many years ago. I was out there, and the same thing, this euthanasia bill was being considered. And the billboard simply had, my life, my death, my choice. And it was meant to appeal euphemistically to this very uh, reality. Um, what struck me was how antipathetic that is to Paul, right? Whether you live or you die, uh, you are the Lord's. It's, it's not my life, it belongs to Christ, not my death, that belongs to him too. So whether I live or die, I am the Lord's. There's a fundamental shift in consciousness from I belong to someone beyond myself, I belong to the Lord. My life does, my death does. Um, it's not my choice. But then the modern, you're, you're at this watershed, the modern view is just the opposite. No, no, choice is absolutely preeminent. My life belongs to me. My death belongs to me, and it's up to me to choose. Um, that's where the battle is really joined. It's a philosophical battle. So we can talk about the particular issues, but it's a, it's a basic philosophical dispute between do you belong to someone higher and beyond yourself, or are you utterly in your own uh, possession? And we fetishize choice in our society. So pro-choice, we associate with abortion. But that's a way of naming our whole culture, yeah. you know, in, in a secular way. We have a pro-choice culture. Hey, as long as I chose it, that's okay. You can choose what you want. I'll choose what I want. But see, with that kind of relativism, any cohesion to the society breaks down. And in fact, the door is open to profound moral evil. When you say, in the first place is choice. Well, why not I, I choose to kill you? I choose to eliminate you. I choose you're in my way. You know, um, unless we're anchored in objective value, we are inviting moral chaos. That's right. Now, we're going to get deeper into the philosophical underpinnings of both the, the, the pro-euthanasia movement and the Catholic response. But sticking on this rhetorical point uh, just briefly, 
how should we describe the act of what they're calling assisted suicide or physician assisted suicide? What's a what's a good rhetorical strategy? How about the taking of an innocent life? It's something that's intrinsically evil. Go back to our last conversation. When you lose that category, uh, you're at sea morally. Uh, so if you name it for what it is, like you know, abortion, the taking of an innocent human life, euthanasia, the taking of an innocent human life, I think is a far more descriptive term. And it's predicated upon this assumption of the intrinsically evil act. No matter how grim things have become, no matter how bad you feel, no matter what the good consequences might be, that act is in itself uh, evil. And when the society um, loses sight of that, we're in serious trouble. So I, I would use that straightforward language of the taking of an innocent life. So turning now to the components of the philosophical debate, yeah. uh, pro-euthanasia advocates often appeal to two different principles. They mash them together, but they're actually two different principles to justify their position, the legalization of euthanasia. One is uh, autonomy over one's yeah. own life and body, right. and the other is compassion in the response to suffering. Uh, so before we dig in more deeply into each one of these and how they might be related to each other, what do you think the, these advocates have in mind when they're they're using autonomy and when they're using compassion? Yeah, autonomy is the supreme modern value. Uh, autonomos, I, I'm my own law. I decide. Um, I'm opposed to any form of heteronomy, a nomos that comes from outside of me. Uh, I'm the lord of my own life. So I was saying that that distinction between the California billboard and Paul to the Romans, that's the fundamental uh, uh, distinction. But see, autonomy is not the great Christian value. You might put it this way, for, for a Christian, theonomy is the value. So not heteronomy, meaning like, now you boss me around. This other person has control over me. That's heteronomy. Theonomy is, no, God, theos, is the nomos of my life. God is the law of my life. If I say that, well, I become truly free because God is the supreme good. And if God becomes the law of my life, then my life is ordered toward the good. And that's freeing for me. That's liberating. That's, that's, um, that's the key to the happy life, right? So it's not autonomy that we hold up, but theonomy. But see, we've been cowed, though, in our culture, we, we Christians. We're cowed into privacy. So we can whisper that value among ourselves. No, no, we should proclaim it from the rooftops. That's the value that truly liberates us, not autonomy, but theonomy. Um, you know, compassion to suffer with is what the word means, kumpatsior. Fair enough. I mean, sure, someone that's suffering either physically, psychologically, spiritually, yeah, I have compassion with that person. But press it. If I want to love that person, right, and that's the, that's the great Christian value. Love means to will the good of the other. It doesn't mean simply... I'm emotionally identifying with you, or I'm sympathizing. That's what that means. I have the same feeling as you do. Fine, but the value is love. Love means willing the good of the other. So you can't say that I'm expressing love by killing you. I can't, I can't take your life, take an innocent life, and say it's an expression of love. So I'd press it that way. It's not autonomy that we want. It's theonomy. It's not really compassion in itself. It's love that we want. Those are the Christian values. In our contemporary culture, one of the issues is we, we've sort of lost our historical memory, and that includes the, the, the history of the development of ideas. Can you speak a little bit about the, the genealogy of the idea of autonomy and how really recent it is in terms of its, its, its both birth and now influence? Yeah, I mean, you want to go really deep with it. I think it comes from a misconstrual of the nature of God. So when God was seen, uh, as I often say, as, as ipsum esse, as the sheer act of to be itself, in which all created things participate, so there's Thomas's uh, vision. When that's lost, and that happened for a number of reasons, and God becomes more of a heteronymous figure outside. Think of, of deism that was very influential at the founding of our country. Well, for a while, you might put up with that God. But after a time, you're going to find that God oppressive, and how, how at home we are with that language, you know, like an oppressive power from outside telling me what to do. Well, as I'm, as I'm moving in that direction, I begin to say, look, I don't want that heteronomy. I want autonomy. Uh, I, I want to be free. I want to be the one that disposes of my own life. 
the key is recovering a proper sense of God, where God is not an other that's hovering threateningly outside my freedom. But God is is the deepest ground of my own being. God is, I often use the, the image of the burning bush, right? That as God comes close, the world becomes more beautiful and more luminous. Um, that's why you know, I, I, I like the way you're pursuing the question because all of these things, they're, they're moral questions, yes, but then keep going. They're metaphysical questions. They depend upon basic metaphysical perceptions. In this case, the right understanding of God is not a threat to us, but is the, the one that makes us luminous and beautiful. So let's now turn to the relationship between the principles of autonomy and compassion, still trying to understand the, the secular conception of them. Uh, oftentimes they're presented together as if one implies the other. To be autonomous necessarily implies you know, showing compassion, and compassion implies autonomy. Uh, but are they really connected? For example, if, if we truly embrace the secular conception of autonomy, why would we list uh, uh, limit assisted suicide only to those who are suffering, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you absolutize autonomy, then you're completely in charge of your own life and you can determine what your values are and you can make every decision you want. Um, sure. Um, and if, look, I, I have compassion for the suffering of people, well, then why not put them out of their misery? You know, why, why not uh, out of compassion, um, you know, solve the problem? But we, see, we can't stay simply within that little narrow framework. You've got to move into the proper moral and metaphysical framework about the good and the, um, the, the seeking and finding of, of the true good. That's the metaphysical issue. So proponents of assisted suicide often regard the what's called the slippery slope argument yeah. as, a, as a straw man. And, no, and the argument says, well, look, man. if we legalize it, we're going to eventually use the same law to involuntarily kill those who are either incapacitated or otherwise incapable of resisting. And they, they respond to the argument, no, we can carefully construct the laws in a way well, that will not happen. What's, what's your response to that? Well, the response is it's, it's empirically false. I mean, you can see the slippery slope. Look in Canada, look in parts of Europe where indeed these you know, originally rather restricted uh, euthanasia laws have devolved very quickly into you know, very aggressive expressions of, of real violence toward people. Uh, so I don't think that's a theoretical issue at all. I think empirically you can see we're on a slippery slope. And you're always on the slippery slope, Matt, when you bracket the intrinsically evil category. Uh, you know, oh no, it's not intrinsically evil. You know, under certain circumstances, we can. And then you bring in, oh, sure, look how the person's suffering. And oh, look, you know, uh, uh, what their, with their own autonomy. Oh, look at the way their family's affected. Well, sure, once that category of the intrinsically evil is gone, then you can justify anything. Can I go back? This is when I was a young guy in the seminary, and um, all the vogue at the time was this proportionalist ethic, which kind of had the same structure. There, there wasn't anything really intrinsically evil about a given act. It all depended on consequences, and you kind of measured good and bad, and then you made a proportional judgment, right? Um, I remember taking that in, and you know, there were, there were bright, convincing people that were laying it out. But I remember the day, really, when it occurred to me, you know, I could justify anything under this rubric. If this is the way to think about the moral life, I could, in principle, justify anything. You know, why not uh, uh, kill this person if there's enough good that comes from it? I mean, why not uh, put this poor old person out of, out of his misery if enough good comes from it? That's, a, I would say, by its nature, a slippery slope. Uh, scenario. You know, once I say no intrinsic evil, yeah, measure the good and evil, <laughs> I can justify whatever I want. So I think the church has got to be a bulwark against that. Who else in our society is speaking these fundamental moral truths? I don't know. You know, you, you know, like an academe, you're not going to find a lot of people who are defending classical morality. So the church. I think that's part of our job to be a bulwark today. So, Bishop, if someone comes to you and says, look, this is a foregone conclusion. This is what society wants. They want to head in this direction. So what we should do as a church is to try and make the laws as restrictive as possible, try to, to write the laws in such a way so that we'll avoid these, these unintended consequences down the line. You say what to that argument? Well, no, if you're dealing with the intrinsic evil, you can't do that. Um, you know, there's a prudential argument, and we've engaged this around the abortion question, you know, if— if there are some uh, 
propose laws that might restrict abortion, the church has said, okay, I mean, we'll, we'll accept whatever we can get. We're, we're not conceding for a moment that, that abortion is anything but intrinsically evil. But if the society at the governmental level is willing to say, well, we'll set up certain restrictions, okay, I can accept that. Um, so there's a prudential, uh, there's room for prudential judgment there, it seems to me. But um, you can never legislate in a way that um, allows for the intrinsically evil. So uh, another argument that um, pro-euthanasia advocates use is um, that when we're arguing from the Catholic standpoint, what we're really doing here is we're taking our irrational, preferential religious beliefs and imposing them on others is 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 that an is that a fair portrayal of the Gallic position? No, and the, one of the great virtues of the Catholic uh, intellectual tradition is that we embrace the natural law, and go back to John Courtney Murray and many others in the 20th century that that saw that as a very promising um, way forward for American Catholics is that we have a way of talking about the moral life that is not it's indeed grounded in the Bible that's true but it's not reducible to the Bible. It can appeal more widely to any person of good mind and goodwill. It appeals to principles that um, any reasonable person should be able to accept. And so when we make our arguments, let's say about abortion, euthanasia, et cetera, we, we don't tend to go back to biblical uh, examples. We don't say, well, the church teaches. We, we tend to rely upon these natural law principles. Um, you know, at the same time, I think it's okay to make explicit reference to the Bible. Um, that is the ultimate ground of our of our um, ideas about the world and about morality. So I think, sure, appeal them. And if it works, great. You know, if, if that will work in a public uh, uh, context, great. But we do have this natural law tradition. Um, and, and look, imposition. Every law is imposing something on people. If I say, let's have a law that you can only drive, you know, 65 miles an hour. Well, I'm imposing, ultimately, a moral vision on, on everybody, right? Why do you limit the speed? Well, so it makes the world safer and it'll save lives, right? That's a moral vision imposed through legislation. Well, all legislation, whether it's tax law, traffic laws, um, laws against homicide, et cetera, they all have a moral basis, they're all, at the end of the day, imposing a moral vision on people. So to me, it's a kind of a canard. It's, it's, a, it's a red herring to pull out the I'm imposing things. Uh, so I would take those two tacks in responding to that. So this would uh, apply more to the internal debate of the prudential level of how to address these societal problems, including euthanasia and abortion. What do you say to those who perhaps in like the, the tradition of Stanley Hauerwas would say things like, we just need to stay away from the natural law arguments. They haven't worked. They're unintelligible. Uh, there's, uh, they're ultimately philosophically uh, unsuccessful. So let's let's only rely on the biblical witness. Yeah, and I've I've always liked Hauerwas and find some of that uh, compelling. You know, man, my bottom line is whatever works. You know, there's a I have kind of a Jamesian side, I suppose, like a, a pragmatist side, like whatever works. If if a natural law argument is persuasive in the public uh, forum. And that's supposed to be its virtue. Now, Howard Watson Company would say, look, they haven't been very persuasive yeah. in the public forum. I get that. I get that. But I would say if they work, great. If the biblical appeal works, great. Howard Watts, in fact, one time appeared before Congress this is years ago, and it was an abortion, you know, related debate. And they asked him, they said, Professor, could you provide, you know, your argument against abortion? And he said, uh, Christians don't kill their children. And the guy said, well, I, I understand that, but could you come up with an argument? He goes, no, no, that's my argument. Christians don't kill their children. So that was <laughs> not appealing to the natural law, but appealing rather boldly and unapologetically to a biblical vision. I'd say whatever works, try it, use it. <laughs> you know, As a Catholic, I, I have an affection for the natural law tradition. I think it, it can and does uh, persuade people. Not always, not always. And maybe the Bible is more compelling to, to the public. To draw it out and look at the implications of, of the way that we frame the debate, natural law and biblical, is it fair to say, though, that at some level we have to appeal to the natural law in the, in the sense that we can't only appeal to revelation to have laws in a society? Is, is it fair to make that claim? Well, it depends on how you construe it, because I suppose I mean, the natural law, I think, does have a relationship to uh, the Bible, that it does find fundamental principles within the Bible. Um, 
But yeah, I mean, you could say within a pluralist society, it's the only kind of reasonable appeal you can make, an appeal to, you know, universal principles of reason and so on. So it's probably, you know, the more effective route, you know. There's also a libertarian critique uh, that goes something like this, uh, the libertarian critique of the Catholic position that says something like, well, you know, a suicide, assisted suicide may indeed be morally wrong, but it's not the state's job to get involved in moral disputes. So if you don't want to participate in assisted suicide, then don't, but let other people make their own choices. How do we respond to that argument? Well, again, I go back to the, the purpose of law. There's always a moral purpose. And to that degree, the state's always involved in, in moral issues. And if you want imposing morality on people, uh, why is the state involved in saying you can't murder people? Why is the state involved in saying you can't steal? Why is the state involved in saying you can't rape people? So, you know, I think that's a that's a exaggerated point of view. I get the libertarian, you know, in, in, impulse behind it, but every law is imposing some kind of moral vision. So that's why, in that way, again, the Hauerwas side, you might say, well, look, you've got your moral framework. I got my moral framework. Let's have a debate in the public and see who wins. You know, let's let's bring our, our competing moral visions out in public and see uh, who can out-narrate the other. So a libertarian may, may even be sympathetic to that position, but say, okay, but what's the limiting principle within Catholic thought that says, well, here that the state does grant you freedom in these realms, and the state should not be involved in the, in these realms. Well, that goes back to Aquinas, you know, where Thomas will say not everything that's morally wrong should be illegal. So famously, Aquinas says that, you know, there should be a, a sector of the city where, you know, prostitution, that people understand what's going on there and so on. And uh, we know oh, that's that's what people are going there for, et cetera. But it, not everything that's immoral and clearly thought that was immoral should be illegal. Now, the reason is sometimes making those things illegal produces far more problems and, and makes the situation more morally complicated. So should the church, you know, in, in its full range of sexual teaching, should that be legally imposed? You know, I would say no, for the same reason. It would cause, you know, more uh, moral problems. So that's a, that's a subtle point, but an important one. Uh, yes, indeed, law is informed by morality, but not everything that's immoral should be illegal. And within that framework, what's the what's a stable principle for determining immoral but legal, immoral, illegal? Yeah, there, there probably isn't you know a super clear principle except the one I articulated following Thomas that in some cases making an immoral thing illegal causes more trouble in the society. It it leads to greater uh, division or greater you know confusion, et cetera. So that's probably the best you can do in terms of a prudential principle. Is it is it uh, just as, uh, fair to say that intrinsically evil acts should always be illegal? No, no, no. Because you know, would again look at the full range of Catholic sexual teaching. Would you make every part of that? We would recognize a number right. of, of that as intrinsically evil, but we wouldn't want laws against them necessarily. I think this shows just how versatile and how yeah. uh, nuanced the Catholic intellectual yeah. tradition is on these moral matters. Yes, because it's a very old tradition and uh, and a very careful one. And someone like Aquinas, you know, who represents a, a subtle view in whatever he says. But um, the, yeah, Paul VI said that you know the church is an expert in humanity, and I've always liked that. Um, I've savored that formulation, given our two thousand year history and great theoreticians, but also great uh, pastoral people. At, at the practical level of hearing confessions and so on, it's made the church an expert in humanity. And so we kind of have a feel for how these things should work. So to wrap things up, we've been responding to the deficiency of the pro-euthanasia position. But how can we state the Catholic view positively, including uh, how we would give a particular response to those who perhaps do have a terminal illness right now, those who are in states where they have the active choice that they could make right now? What do we tell them? That they're loved by God and that life is is beautiful and that they have dignity and that so their life should never be directly attacked. But also to, to, to um, emphasize that clinging to life in this world is not an absolute value. So the acceptance of death as, as a natural part of life, that's also a good thing. And so those who are opposed to euthanasia are not saying, you know, by by any and all means, cling to life. So the church talks about, you know, ordinary and extraordinary means, for example, that we're not obligated to take any possible means to save our, our biological life. No, at a certain point, 
you can let go and allow yourself to die or allow another to die. We use that language. You know, so um, we're not taking such an absolutist position that we're just trying to cling desperately to life in this world. We honor life, the dignity of life. You can't actively take it. But there's also, you know, the legitimacy in accepting death, allowing someone to die. Um, I think that's part of the nuance of the Catholic view. And to those who say the church just doesn't understand how much I'm suffering or how much my loved one is suffering, how do we respond to that? I think of all the people within the church who care for those who are who are dying. And, you know, thank God for hospice programs and thank God, too, for the medical means we have now to alleviate, I mean, most forms of, of physical suffering as people approach death. You know, the appeal to the, the horrific suffering people have. Yes, indeed, sometimes that still is the case. But most of the time now, we have the medical means to deal with that. Uh, but, but I would say that the church has so many people and institutions that care for those who are dying. We're, we're well aware of those dynamics. Well, thank you, Bishop. It's now time for our uh, listener question. Uh, this one comes from uh, Dara from Massachusetts, who asks about praying for the dead. Okay. Hi, Bishop Barron. My name is Dara. I live in Acton, Massachusetts. And I just have a quick question. I've had a season of quite a bit of loss, both friends and family, young and old. And I'm just wondering, why exactly do we pray for the dead? And can I pray for the the dead souls of, of atheists and non-Catholics. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. To the second part, yes, absolutely. Um, why do we pray for the dead? The same way, the reason we pray for the living is an expression of, of solidarity in God. So we reach out to those who've gone to a different uh, dimension, but are still in, in relation to us, still connected to us. And we, we pray for them the same way we pray for each other here on earth. Um, you know, for the divine help, the divine grace. And yeah, of course you can pray for anybody. Uh, you know, God's mercy reaches out to to all. And I think praying for the living and the dead, which is one of the spiritual works of mercy, um, expresses that. So absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Bishop, for joining You're us welcome. again. Look forward to seeing you again soon on the Word on Fire show. Good. Thanks, man. That does it for us today. Thanks for joining us on the Word on Fire show. If you're interested in learning more about how Word on Fire can help you grow closer to Christ and become a better evangelist with and for others, consider joining the Word on Fire Institute. Check us out at institute.wordonfire.org. That's institute.wordonfire.org. See you next time.